Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Go ahead and go to Genesis chapter 1. We, we've been talking and have been talking now for about two months on blood covenant. And we said we wanted to move into teaching on the authority of the believer, which is where we're headed this morning. Everybody say glory to God. Hallelujah. We're going to start talking about the authority of the believer. Amen. And, of course, obviously, to understand the authority of the believer, you've got to understand authority in the first place. And so let's go, if we will, to Genesis, the first chapter, starting in verse, about verse 26. God has created man. I mean, created all the things of the earth and um, separated the water from the, the skies and the dry land and all the different things he's done. Praise the Lord. And um, we, we find here God says in verse 26 of Genesis, chapter 1, and God said, let us, now why does God say let us? There's not a bunch of gods running around. We had the, the Godhead, we had the, the Trinity, we had the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. One of, one of the names for God in the Old Testament is Jehovah. I mean, we got the Lord, we, I mean, um, well, Yahweh in the Old Testament. We have um, different, different names for God, but one of them is Elohim. And the word Elohim means plurality of majesty in, in three or more. God is a plurality of the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. We did not know the Son as the Son in the Old Testament, although he, was, he did exist as the Son. In the beginning, you know, the, the Son was with the Father. And so we, uh, we have that. So when God said, let us, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost said, let us make man in our image. After our likeness. Amen. Um, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them, that's man, and understand the term man was in reference to mankind and not male species. We get people writing the feminist Bible. We got the, the, and she said, I'm so fed up with a bunch of stupid, devil-minded people trying to act like, and under the guise of Christianity, destroy, destroy the word of God. Amen. All right. Mankind, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them... Have dominion. This is authority. Over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And like Buddy Harrison used to say, thank God we got authority over creeps. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he them. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So we see in original creation, God created man with dominion. Now, different translations will use the word authority instead of dominion, but it's the same thing. If you've got dominion over something, you've got authority over it. Okay? I mean, what, what the word kingdom means. The king's domain. Okay? What's his domain? That which he has dominion over, authority over. All right? So here is man created in the beginning with the dominion over everything on the earth. Look over, if you will, real quick to the eighth psalm. Hallelujah. Psalm, psalm 8. It says, O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Hey, remember, the, that makes me think of that Sandy Patty song. <laughs> pretty, pretty awesome song, amen. And uh, who has set thy glory above the heavens, out of the mouth of babes and suckling, thou hast ordained strength because of thine enemies. Thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider the heavens and the works of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou hast made him to have dominion over the works of thy hands, and hast put all things under his feet. Now, whose feet? Not Jesus's. This was not a reference to being under the feet of Jesus. It was a reference to the fact that God put all things under the feet of man. Okay? All ox, sheep and oxen, yea, the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the, Lord, the, the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. 
So here we have the psalm says, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Thou hast created them a little lower than angels. Now, actually, the Hebrew there is, guess what that word angels is? Elohim. God did not create us as a lower standing than angels themselves. We, we have authority over angels. God created man a little lower than himself. He had an under ruler. We were not equal with God. We were created in the image of God. We were to rule, man was to rule the earth as God ruled heaven. Amen? That's the way it's supposed to be. That was what was supposed to happen. Well, what happened? Everybody say the devil. Now, let me ask you something. You're the devil. What was man going to have dominion over if God was creating everything good? The devil. Now, contrary to that which we heard preachers say on television one time, a local preacher, the devil's not God's puppy dog sit to sick on, sick on you. He don't sick the devil on you. The devil will get on you without God sending him. Hello. All right. Now, man was created to rule and to reign over the earth. Man was created to have dominion over the earth. Man was created to be in charge of all things. And let me tell you something. Let's get back to Genesis now. Genesis chapter 3. What did God tell Adam and Eve? And, and this is, I was trying to give me a little prop there from my, it ain't working. All right. I'll tell you what we need. This is great not having to pull up the podium in and out of here. We need one of them tabletop lectern things I can put on here that sits right on top of this. Hallelujah. There we go. Huh? All right. I'll be not in the floor. I know what you're thinking. All right. Back in Genesis, what did God tell Adam and Eve? He says, look here in, in verse 15, Lord took man and put him in the garden to eat, eat and to dress and to keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of the fruit of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that thou, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest, thou shalt surely die. Now, the word phrase, or the phrase there, shall surely die in the Hebrew is, In dying thou shalt die. All right? Why? Well, had you, did you notice that when Adam and Eve did eat the fruit, they didn't fall over dead? In the day they ate fruit, they eat, eat there, thou shalt surely die. No, they did die. They died spiritually. They became alienated and separated from God. And so that took them another 900 years for the body to die. Or him anyway. Okay? And so Adam did die when he ate the fruit. He just didn't fall over physically dead. There was so much life of God in him because it was, had, no, had not known sin. Did you know that man's body was originally created never to die? Only because of the fall was there a set in motion becoming mortal or death-doomed bodies. Before that, man would have lived forever. And that was God's plan. God's plan was man for never to die, never to encounter death. And let me say this. I like to throw this out here when I say this. Notice that they were not to eat of the fruit of the, of the, tree, of the, fr the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The knowledge of good and evil is not good. Well, you got to know people going through to help them. No, you don't. Your knowledge of sin does not make you better at ministering to people who are going through sin. What makes you better is the anointing. Everybody that's been in prison thinks they've got a prison ministry. You may not need to be back around them people because you're still struggling with stuff in your life. Hello? If you were a gutter addict, you may not need to, may need to be down on the streets with all the people who are, who are shooting up and stuff. Well, I know what they're going. No, you don't need to be in that. You might not need to be in, to be in that environment. Well, I, I disagree with you. Well, let me ask you something. Who was the most qualified minister of the New Testament for the um, Jews? Paul. He was the most educated of, of all of the disciples that we know of. He studied at the feet of Gamaliel. Gamaliel, is that right, Brother Bill? Gamaliel. Okay, that word. Huh? Gamaliel? Gamaliel. Anyway, that guy. All right, I just don't ever, you know, just me and words sometimes, I just don't get it right. That word was one of them, you know, he was a doctor of the law. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He, had, he was a freeborn Roman. I mean, he, he was the most qualified minister to the Jews. Who was probably the best qualified to minister to the Greek, the Gentiles, the heathen? Peter! Peter! Where did God send him? P. 
Peter to the Jews and Paul to the Greeks. Why? Because it's the anointing and not your, not your past that qualifies you. Amen? Paul's education and Paul's training did not make him any good for the Gentiles. And Peter's training didn't make him any good for the Jews. Are you here? The knowledge of good and evil is not good. Now, we love to put on Christian television the guy who was the gutter snipe. Lived the most horrid life you can fathom. Went through the worst things you can imagine and got saved. We rarely, if ever, put the person on there that grew up in church and served God and never turned away and always served the Lord the whole life and bring them in and give their testimony. Why? Because it's not good television. I think we need some standards out there to let people see. You can live this way your whole life and never go away from it. Now, what happens if you do? God has restoration. God has mercy. I'm just saying the church needs to stop sensationalizing things for the sake of ratings on television. We need to be more about, you know, training, training all the way up. Thank you. That just showed up. I don't know where it showed up from, but it just showed up from Jeff's hand. Hallelujah. Thank you so much. I just spilled it all over the front of me. Hallelujah. Amen. So, you can eat of the fruit of the knowledge of truth and good and evil, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. All right? What's the command of God? Don't eat there. Genesis chapter 3. Now, the serpent was more subtle. This is why we need to understand our authority. He did not say the serpent is blatant in your face. He said he's subtle. He's subtle. We got things going on in the church today. The acceptance of homosexuality, the acceptance of abortion, the acceptance of sin all over the place because people feel like, well, they need love too. They need the love of God. They don't need a perverse love that's, that's contrary to what God did and what God says. But you see, he plays on your, the subtlety of your emotions. Well, it's not right that they don't have love. What if they want to love your three-year-old child? That, yeah, and then the shotgun comes out. Yeah, yeah, all of a sudden that's different. No. It's not that God has a moral code. But the devil will play on the emotions of people and the logicness or the, or the reasoning of man to bring sin in and even into the church. Satan is subtle. And he'll play on any arena of your life. He, and let me say this, folks. You know, we, we kind of mock the devil. I mean, Shambot used to call him Slewfoot. You know, and, and all kinds of things. And we, have, you know, we want to mock the devil and he's, he's deformed, brain dead and all this kind of stuff. But the Bible says he's subtle. He uses, he uses areas in your life that you, that you don't know he's using against you. Because he wants to draw you away from what God said. Look, if y'all figure that by now, I don't like wearing glasses. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. Now Satan will always question God. And it doesn't matter what arena. He'll question the existence of God. He'll question the validity of God's commandments. He'll question God in any way he can in your thinking, in your mind, in your reasoning. Why? Because if he can question that, he can pull you into his trap. What's wrong with doing this? What's wrong with doing that? It's not hurting anybody. But God said, don't do it. Hath God said? And here what he did. Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Oh, it's so here. Now what he did is, he brought her into a conversation, or in you, or in us, he bring us into a reasoning thought. And did God really mean that, 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 that? Now, I've had people come up with this one. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, you know, you, you want to slap stupid sometimes, but as preachers, you've got to be love on people. 
Well, I mean, marijuana is an herb, and God created herbs, and so uh, it's all right to smoke dope. No. It's not all right to smoke dope. It's, it's harmful to you. Why did he create it? Do you know where in a fallen world, things have happened? there are things in the earth right now that God didn't create. They were, they were perverted from the original creation. God didn't create opium so people could shoot up heroin. Or, or you know, not, not opium, um, poppy seeds. Okay? He didn't create that for, the, you know, he created to put it on as a garnish on top of your little biscuit so you can go test for opiates when you go get your drug test. <laughs> I had poppy seed muffin this morning. Don't do it the day you're getting tested. I'm kidding, messing with you now. And the woman said that we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said you should not eat it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. God did not tell him not to touch it. He, as a matter of fact, he told Adam to dress it. He was sent there to dress to keep every tree in the garden. He said just don't eat the fruit of this tree. See, now what happens when the minute... Satan, through his subtlety, can get you into reasoning or a conversation about what God said or God didn't say. He'll get you confused. That is why we must exercise dominion or authority in those hours and those times. Can you understand what I'm saying? See, he got her into a conversation, and by getting into that conversation, he got her confused about what God said. She went as far as to say, God told us not to eat it and not even touch it. That's not what he said. He told Adam, you're to dress all the trees of the garden. You're to keep, dress all the trees of the garden. But this tree, don't eat of it. Don't eat the fruit. Hello? Listen to this next thing. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. For God, now this, first of all, he said God lied to you. God said, in the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. You will not die. God lied to you. It's a lie. When the preacher stands up, when Pastor Ed stands up, reads the Bible, he's lying to you when he says, don't do this or don't do that. That the Bible says don't do. He's a liar. God's a liar. This is the next thing. Not only does he say that God's a liar, he questions his integrity. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. He questions the integrity of God that God's told them not to eat of it because he's holding out on them that there's something better in life than doing what he said the way he said do it. He's trying to keep you from being like you can be, all that you can be. He's holding you back from all your potential, which is to be as God's. But I've already told you, the knowledge of good and evil is not good. But Satan says, God says, if you eat, God's not letting you eat this because when you do, you'll be a God and you'll, because you'll know both good and evil, that'll make you a God. God's holding out on you. Are you here? Satan wants you to believe that, number one, God is a liar. Number two, God's word is not true. And number three, he has impure, wrong motives. He's trying to keep you out of something. But did not the word of God already say, let us create man in our image after our likeness. What did God do? God created man in a class like himself. When they came to Jesus, remember what Jesus, happened with Jesus? They came to him and said, what you're preaching, you make, you're making yourself God. He said, have you not read, heard it read? Ye are gods. God had already made us gods. He made us the under rulers of the earth. Look over you real quick. I know, uh, heresy, heresy, heresy. Go, if you will, to Corinthians. I believe it's 2 Corinthians, chapter 10, verse 4. It could be 1 Corinthians, but I think it's 2. The reason I'm saying I think because it's not my notes. <laughs> Shocker. Oh, come on. Sorry, brother, in whom the God of this world is blind to the eyes. Second Corinthians 4.4. 4. I was looking at 2 Corinthians 10.4, which is good. All right. 
2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. I was in 10.4, which is a good verse, but it's, it's not what I was going for. It would, it would tie into this, but it's not. Verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we've received mercy, we faint not. We've re renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. Now, what does Satan want to do with preachers? Those who minister to your life. The ulterior motives. All they're after is your money. Money, bunch of money-grubbing dogs. They're after your money. Ah, oh, they got ulterior motives. They, they tell you not to do this, not do that, because, you know, they don't want you to have any fun. They got, they, they're, they're, they're prudes. They're Victorian. Hello. They're homophobic. Pedophobic. Now, let me tell you something. I'm going to throw this in here. If you don't, I've been saying it, and people, th th people think I'm crazy. The next big move will be for pedophilia to be accepted by society, and you'll be, a pet, you'll be some kind of, you have some kind of phobia when you don't agree with it. They're already changing the term in psychological circles from pedophilia to minor attracted adults. That's the articles they're writing now. They're not calling them pedophiles. They're calling them minor attracted adults. Now, they did the same thing. They changed the terminology on homosexuality a few years ago. They're creating an acceptance by changing the terminology. But Paul wrote and said, we have not handled the word of God deceitfully. But by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. In whom, and this is the phrase that I'm after, the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ shine unto them, um, uh, who is the image of God, shine, should shine unto them. Satan is called the God of this world. Who's Satan? We know that in the Old Testament, he's referred to as Lucifer, the bright and morning star, the, 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 the one who, uh, who was created with tabrets, pipes in him, who was covered in topazes and diamonds and jewels, and he walked the circumference of the earth. He was the choir leader of heaven. And like some people said, the devil fell out of heaven straight into the choir. Because where a lot of churches have their, their problems, in the choir. I don't want to sing that song. Yeah. I mean, you couldn't carry a tune in the bucket, and you want to sing lead. You can't stay on pitch, I mean, uh, for, to save your life. You want to see him lead. And you're going to split the church. And they even came out with a song back in the, about the late 70s, early 80s called, Please Let Me Sing in the Choir. And they went, Please let me sing in the choir, in the choir. Please let me sing in the choir. And it was Uncle Charlie. I, I just come up with a name. Uncle Charlie couldn't sing. They wouldn't ever let him sing in the choir because he couldn't sing. Then he died. Then they, woke, they came to church the following Sunday after he died and right in the middle of the church service, this heavenly voice came out of heaven and it was Uncle Charlie. I'm wondering if that was coming out of heaven or where it was coming from. The devil felt that. Anyway, but Satan was not created as a god. He was created as an angelic being. He was one of the anointed cherubs that covereth. He was one of the archangels. Okay? He fell from his estate, and he came to the earth having great wrath. Jesus said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. What's that tell you? He came out of heaven at 186,000 miles a second. He came out at light speed. Why? Because if you go to Ezekiel, you'll find, he said, I will ascend my throne into heavens, I'll be as the most high. And God said, I'll cast you as profane out of my presence. And, and uh, he, he, he cut for me for boogie and split. Because God cast him out. But the Bible says he came down having much wrath. Well, what did he want? He wanted the whole time God's throne. That was perfect until the day iniquity was found in thee. Talking about Satan, Lucifer, Beelzebub. Lord of the flies, or as I like to call them, the maggot God. That's not a real stretch. Flies come from maggots. Satan's bills above the Lord of the flies. That makes him the maggot God or maggot king. Woo! How would you like to be Lord of the maggots? 
Now, they're, the, they're about the grossest thing you'll ever see. Get some old rotten meat somewhere, much of mac. That just gross you out. Does it gross anybody out? Yeah, I can tell I'm grossing you. Here we have, and I, I'm, not really, I'm, I'm not really going to deal with the, and whom the God of this world blinded the mouth. I want to talk about the God of this world, that phrase, the God of this world. How did Satan get dominion and authority when in the Garden of Eden God gave it to man? It was transferred to him or delegated over to him when Adam and Eve committed high treason against the word of God. And when, let's go back to Genesis. So Satan is called the God of this world in the New Testament. But how did he get that place? You shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the days, verse 5, chapter 3, that you eat thereof, your eyes will be open, you'll be as, be as God's knowing good and evil. And the woman, listen, here are the three temptations of life. Saw that the, good, the food was good to eat. The lust of the eyes. And pleasant to the uh, uh, eyes. The lust of the flesh. And desire to make one eye wise, the pride of life. She took of the fruit thereof, did eat, then went across the garden and found Adam fishing in the pond that he didn't even know what was going on and sub secretly handed her the apple and he ate. And then went, woman, what did you do to me? Now I say that because I remember in Sunday school coloring the picture of Adam fishing and Eve showing up with the fruit and handing it to him. And everybody say, where will we be without Eve? In the garden. No, Adam would be in the garden alone. Without Eve. Now we, look, we know from the New Testament, the Bible says that, that the woman was, that the man was, the, that the man had failed in sin because he, he it says that Adam, that Eve, Eve gave him the fruit, and partook of the fruit, and Adam was with her. He was standing right there the whole time this was going on. And what did he have? He had authority. And he didn't exercise it. All he had to say is, I take authority over you. I have dominion over you, Satan, serpent. And on your belly, you're going to crawl. And on your belly, you're going to eat dust all the days of your life. I bind you and cast you out of this. God had given him dominion over all the earth. But instead of the dominion, he sat there like a knot on the log. No, he was a frog on the knot on the log. That in the eyes. This whole thing would have never happened. If Adam had taken his authority at the moment. Let me say this. There are going to be points in your life. There are going to be points in your day. There are going to be points and events that take place. That if you will take your authority. The events that follow will not happen. Amen. The path to destruction. And the path to uh, misery. The path to problems. Will not happen if you will take your authority at the moment. That Satan shows up to question God. I don't feel very authoritative. It doesn't matter. Authority is not based on your feelings. You will live a more victorious, consistent life if when the devil shows up and hath God said, God knows that if you go ahead and go out and do whatever it is you're thinking about doing, getting down with the neighbor's wife, I'm just put it, put it like it is. Hello? And let me tell you something. When the devil comes and says, God don't mind. He knows you've got needs. She sent, God sent you to help take, she's got needs. Her husband's not taking care of her. He's too busy working. And he sent you to take care of her. Thou shalt not, and God said, but God said, thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's wife. So what do you do? You better take authority over that at the moment he questions what God said. Instead of giving in to what? The lust of the flesh. What do you mean lust of the flesh? 
pleasant to the eye. She might be a, she might be a looker. And you might like the way she looks. Hello? Hell, come on now. I said, come on now. So what are you going to have to do? You're going to have to take authority and say, in the name of Jesus, I, w I will. My body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. I will not join myself to that which God has not ordained and God has not blessed me with, Amen. which is my wife. What if he ain't married? Wait. Amen. We live in America. It's the 21st, 20, 21st century. 20, okay, 21st. It's, it always messes you up. It's the, it's the century after the number, you know. It's a, like 1900 was the 20th century. And it really was because we were in the 20th century that ended at 2000. The devil will question God's word. Hello? We had a, um, let, me, let me tell you. I'm going to tell you. We need to use our authority. A lot of Christians don't know they have authority. And we're going to cover more of this. Oh, my Jesus. Really? I'm just warming up. I'm just warming up. My sermon's just getting going. Did y'all eat before you came? You'll have food that you're not of because I'm going to keep preaching. Hello? Listen to me well. If you will exercise your authority at the moment Satan shows up, you will avoid so many things in life that you deal with and you have struggles to overcome. Amen. You will win life's battles. Amen. I said you will win life's battles Amen. by doing so. You will not win them letting him get you into a conversation. When you witness to people, you, don't, you can't talk to them about, what about this, what about that? What, no, no, you, no, no. you must be born again. My message is to you, God sent his son to die for you, to redeem you from your transgressions. You know, you must be born again. I don't believe I'm sin, sin, okay? You need to end your conversation. Because you don't need to sit there and argue with them. It's not your job to win them. It's your job to give them the message. It's the Holy Spirit's job to deal with them. Brother Hagin had somebody come to him one time, and the guy came in and started doing this. And he says, I don't believe there's a God, and uh, I don't believe there's a heaven, and I don't believe there's a hell. But if I die, and there is a heaven, and there is a hell, and I go to hell, it's your fault. He looked at the guy and said, well, the Bible says they that come to him must believe that he is. You don't believe that he is, so I'm not going to bother talking to you, and walked off. <laughs> Happened three times. Finally, Lord said, hey, Brother Hagin said, Lord, deal with that man. He's old. He could die any minute. He got a heart problem. He could die any minute and go into eternity and go into hell. He said, deal with him. That guy came to him one day right, right, during that meeting because it was a long meeting. and came back and said, I I'm ready to talk now. He said, for the past three nights, I've been laying down in bed. And it's like that scripture you've been quoting me, standing at the foot of my bed talking to me. They that come to God must believe that he is. He said, I believe that he is. See, he'd been saying, I don't believe there is a God. See, we get him getting the word. When the devil comes, you don't get in an argument with him. You don't have to, you, you, just, you just take your authority and go on about your business. In Jesus' name. Can you say amen? amen. So, how did, so, so what happened? At the moment, so they, they do this. They eat the fruit. Verse, chapter 3, verse um, 6. The woman saw the food was good for food. Pleasant to the eyes. Desired to make the uh, one wise took the fruit thereof and did eat and gave it to her husband. He did eat and the eyes of both of them were opened and they saw they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. What happened? At that moment, at that moment, Adam was the first man to be born again. He was born from life unto death and Satan became his spiritual father. And if you don't believe me, see what Jesus said in John 8, 44. Ye are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will fulfill. Talking to those who are outside the kingdom of God, Satan became the spiritual father of mankind and got the God authority God had vested into man so he became the God of this world. That wasn't his plan, and we're going to have to stop and pick up next week. That was a means to the ends of his plan. 
Are y'all getting anything out of this yet? Yeah, this, this is an appetite. This, this was a cheese sticks. You know, go into a restaurant, get some mozzarella sticks, some marinara, you know. Yeah, that's just to hold you over till the kitchen gets done cooking your, your food. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.